Thanks. Um, I'm going to start with an apology to say that this is the only Spanish that you're going to see, <laughs> or in, uh, indeed here. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, the work that I've um, been doing, looking at um, environmental preferences from an evolutionary perspective. Um, and I'm going to show you uh, four case studies. Um, starting with my work on uh, um, cacti, uh, cactaceae um, and then going through some of the work that I did for my uh, PhD. So starting with uh, cacti. This doesn't use any um, traditional niche modelling but um, looks at um, biome presence for different cactaceae species and presents a good example of how we can use phylogenetic trees to try to understand um, the evolution of um, environmental preferences and introduces concepts of uh, ancestral state reconstruction. So, um, I, I felt it was a good place to start with the uh, cactaceae because um, Mexico is the um, global diversity hotspot for um, cacti. Um, I did this work in collaboration with um, Rolando Barcenas at uh, Caritaru and uh, Julie Hawkins at the uh, University of Reading. Um, the project was to try to produce DNA barcodes for um, all Mexican um, cactaceae species, but once we had those barcodes um, and had done the sort of species level identification work that was the intention of the project, we felt we could carry on, produce a phylogeny, and then try to look at um, some um, uh, evolutionary questions. So um, when I tell people I live in the UK about working with um, um, cacti, they, they immediately say, oh, okay, so um, you, you've been to lots of deserts and uh, collected uh, 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 lots of species there. Uh, and I have to sadly say no, but um, it's, it's one of these sort of um, key charismatic species that you see them and you automatically think deserts when you see them. Um, I do this um, talk to A-level students at the zoo, where um, to sort of demonstrate the concept of um, um, adaptations to niches. I, I put on pictures of like a cactus and a penguin and ask them to put them in the correct environment uh, because everyone sees a cactus on the media. Um, but of the 15 to 1800 um, cacti species, actually the majority of them aren't found in true deserts, but are, um, are more common in uh, what you might call the direct scrublands. So um, we produced this phylogeny, and here's a, just a quick picture of it. Um, I, I know some of the other guys have um, shown phylogenies, and I just wanted to make sure that people were sort of comfortable with the uh, Phylogenies. Phylogenies demonstrate evolutionary relationships between organisms, and so we can see that uh, um, here we've got our 600 species, and uh, those species that are um, close together on the tree are more closely related to each other uh, than those further apart. So here we've got the cacti clade, we've got all the mammalarias up here. Uh, along with the Corypanthers, and here we've got um, Cylindropuntias. Cylindropuntias are um, true desert specialists and a particular favourite of our collaborator, uh, Rolando. Um, and here you've got the other Apuntias, so uh, Apuntia because indica, the um, common cultivated cactus. Okay. I'm going to come back to this um, phylogeny uh, a, a few times, but uh, uh, essentially, 600 species, actually 666, which is a number that sticks in my head. Um, so once you have a phylogeny, we can do something called ancestral state reconstruction. So apologies if this is um, 
simplistic, but um, just to introduce the concepts. So here's our phylogeny. It's just a simple phylogeny of three taxa, okay? These two taxa are more closely related to each other than they are to this third. Now, the principle of phylogenetic reconstruction um, traditionally rests on the principle of parsimony, where we're trying to minimise the character state changes um, in our reconstruction, and that helps us to um, identify which species are closely related to each other. So, once we have our phylogeny, we can take any sort of characteristic of our organisms. So, in, in this case, I've used the um, uh, single base um, um, DNA, which is what we commonly uh, uh, build our phylogenies with. So, here we've got uh, a T character at a particular base, here we've got an A, and here we've got a T. Okay? And the um, most parsimonious reconstruction here is that the ancestral state here is a T, because that means there's only one character state change in the evolution somewhere on this branch from a T to an A. Any other reconstruction is less parsimonious because it involves two changes over uh, evolutionary time. Okay, so to start with, just a simple case of um, um, geography. Okay, so here with our 600 odd species, we've classified them as to be in uh, North America or South America, north in red, south in black. Okay, um, we're heavily sampled in Mexico, so we're probably biased towards North America. But the uh, interesting thing here is that the basal lineages are South American. Okay, so when we do our ancestral state reconstruction, we get the majority of the tree being North American, but the base, um, and so the ancestral lin li lineages being South American. Okay, and this is actually in agreement with um, um, other hypotheses and uh, um, other studies. Okay, so um, once we've collected our um, samples, we also try to collect some distribution data. Um, I'm going to focus on um, Mexico, um, but um, we actually collected uh, data for the um, whole of the Americas. Um, the Mexican data is probably best. When we, when we try to do um, species diversity hotspots, which is you know, what you can see here, um, you can see that some species, so the Cylindropontias, are particularly um, diverse in uh, Baja, uh, particularly in the uh, northern uh, deserts. Okay? Other species, Mammalaria, are um, more focused on the central regions. There's probably some collecting bias here, but um, uh, a lot of the distribution data, apart from coming from um, botanical collections, also came from um, um, what I'm going to call private collectors. Um, uh, cacti are incredibly charismatic plants, um, uh, very, very heavily collected by very obsessive collectors who know down exactly where they're from. Um, we were fortunate to, to get hold of some of that data um, in, in order to, to produce these sort of maps. So um, we, we noticed that you know we've got some. Um, what we might call phylogenetic patterns in that certain groups are specific to certain areas, and then we wanted to then look at uh, rather than uh, look at some broad definition of climatic conditions in each of these areas. So what we did was we took the um, WWF um, biome classification. Again, this is a global classification of biomes that I've just shown the. the uh, Mexican uh, subset, um, and we are interested in dis distinguishing the sort of desert biomes from the desert biomes. And we can see the little black crosses here are our uh, distribution data points. Um, we wanted to see, you know, if, you know, where the diversity is, and to then drill down for each of these points to then work out a biome profile for each species. Now this is admittedly a very coarse description of biome, um, really intended for a, a global level analysis, and when we look 
uh, at a sort of country scale, yeah, it, um, it's it's not as good as it could be. So we took these biome classifications and we put it on the phylogeny, okay? So here's the base of the phylogeny, here's the cacti, <coughs> these are all the mammalarias and chloropanthas. Here's our desert specialist um, Cylindropuntia group, and uh, red signifies desert, okay? So all of these species are desert species and the ancestral reconstruction for this group is it's a desert group, okay? But predominantly what we see when we look at this phylogeny is not um, the red of deserts, but the, um, the sort of yellowy orange of the xeric scrublands. Okay? And so this is the, 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 the message from this, is that our reconstructions say that um, if you like cacti aren't really desert specialists, they're xeric specialists, uh, with the idea that um, these groups were, rather than diversifying within desert conditions when the desert conditions appeared, they were pre-adapted to dry conditions that they could then move into the deserts once they appeared. Okay, um, I probably covered <coughs> most of this. Okay, so most of the diversity is found in xeric regions rather than the true harsh desert conditions. Okay, um, and this is sort of counter to the, so some hypotheses that suggest you know, that there was diversity in cacti because of the appearance of deserts. Um, we really favour a, a sort of pre-adaptation to dry conditions and then a, a spread within deserts. But as I said, the biomes are really broad classes that aren't exact and uh, it might be better to try to look at more specific environmental conditions rather than a broad biome classification. Okay? Um, one of the sort of issues with this is that many, many of our cacti species were found in multiple biomes, particularly we had an issue with species just on the cusp of these classifications that would fit in two biomes. Um, it might be much better to try to use environmental niche models to get a better handle on the specific environmental requirements rather than using the broad biome classifications. And this is something that we'd hope to do later on. But here I just wanted to introduce the concept of ancestral reconstructions and environmental preferences. So that, that sort of builds up to the, the idea of um, using ancestral state reconstruction for specific environmental characteristics. So again, apologies for the simplicity of this thing, but here we show uh, traditional uh, DNA bases as our ancestral state reconstruction. We can put other characteristics on here, such as climatic conditions, okay? But we describe climatic conditions not with little smiley face suns, but with actual numbers. Okay, and these aren't numbers might be average conditions, they might be the extreme conditions that we've observed. Okay? And it's essentially just some tables of numbers where for each um, characteristics such as temperature or precipitation, we can reconstruct at each ancestral node on our phylogeny a value using uh, a continuous character um, reconstruction. Okay? Once we have uh, any ancestral node a set of numbers for temperature and precipitation and so on, we essentially have what's required for an environmental niche model. Okay? Because the models are defined by a set of numeric parameters. So, for example, the simple um, biochem model uh, is essentially bound just by the minimum and the maximum observations, or probably the 95% com um, confidence intervals of the observations, um, and, and that can be used to 
um, select areas. So once we've reconstructed our um, ancestral bio numerical, what we can do is then try to use um, our, uh, our phylogenies to estimate the times at which our ancestral nodes occur. Okay, so um, there's a well-used technique called uh, temporal calibration of phylogenies or molecular dating of phylogenies, where there's an assumption that um, the sequence difference between organisms is related to time. And if we can fix on our phylogeny using, say, fossil evidence, a particular <coughs> node on our phylogeny, okay, we can then read off all of the other nodes to say, okay, these are relative times. If I fix one node at one particular time, I can then say, okay, this node is probably five million years old, plus or minus some error margin. Okay? So once we have that, we can combine all of these things together, our you know, environmental niche model, our phylogeny, our time scale for that phylogeny, to produce ancestral niche models and then project them into um, and, uh, paleoclimate reconstructions in order to estimate ancestral areas. So it, uh, a whole bunch of a whole bunch of steps of really controversial techniques. So um, we, um, as the colour and I sort of came up with the name polyclimatic modelling, um, but it's not really a new idea. We started this work in 2004, and you know at this time there are a whole bunch of other studies that have tried to do in um, many similar things. In, uh, so uh, uh, Dan Peterson's work on uh, niche conservatism um, and lots and lots of other studies. Um, so I feel a bit like I, I used to work as a management consultant and. Uh, there's a good definition of management consultants is that they're people who borrow your watch and then tell you the time. So I, I feel a bit like I'm um, borrowing these people's watches and presenting it to my own. Uh, lots and lots of other words have gone before this. Uh, so the first case study is um, uh, some use. Uh, carnivorous plants, Drosera. They're actually in the, um, uh, directly below us, or sort of out and down. There's, a, uh, there's some really good examples of sundews in the, uh, the greenhouse below us, uh, including one, I think, Drosera pensis in flower. It's worth, worth looking at if you like flowers. Um, sundews, uh, globally distributed, but um, um, really have a um, diversity hotspots in Mediterranean climates. Uh, uh, this is an example. They have like the, um, the sticky leaves that uh, um, basically flies hit, get stuck, and then uh, the plants absorb the nutrients. Okay. Uh, the main diversity is in southwest Australia. About 30% of the species can be found here. Um, southwest Australia is one of uh, five or so Mediterranean climate biomes, Mediterranean climate, are uh, classified by um, winter rainfall and um, hot summer dry conditions. And that places a certain um, physiological restraint on um, uh, organisms. So uh, sundews, um, uh, particularly Southwest Australia sundews, essentially fly <coughs> back um, to something like a tuber over the summer and then grow over the winter when the rain 